Hi everybody, um, I'm Stu Gott and this is a practical guide to CubeVert, hopefully a guide for the rest of us. Um, just a current uh, state of the world or you know, a statement on where it is, um, containers are increasingly becoming the de facto standard of how we're uh, packaging uh, applications um, and Kubernetes and OpenShift are becoming kind of the de facto way that we do that. Um, but that's for new applications. Uh, when you start talking about virtual machines, I've heard some people say they're going away. Well, no, they're not. Uh, for business reasons, uh, it's hard to redo some applications, and for technical reasons, it may be impossible to do that. Uh, for instance, if you need Windows in a machine, or um, if you attended the Unikernel's talk yesterday, that would not be something you would put directly in a container. Now, in today's world, uh, we traditionally have separate management infrastructures for these uh, stacks, which unfortunately means underutilizing some hardware because you just can't mix. So that's where KubeVert comes in. Uh, we're looking at a technology that enables uh, unifying these two uh, infrastructures um, so that you can build, modify, deploy applications uh, that are virtualized uh, alongside your containers. Or in other words, put virtual machines right into your Kubernetes product projects. So we do this uh, by using a custom resource definition uh, that we drop into existing Kubernetes clusters. Now this is really important to, uh, to say. Um, we don't uh, require, we, one of our requirements for ourselves is that we do not allow uh, modification of the Kubernetes cluster before we deploy. In other words, we can't uh, change container runtimes, we can't uh, add uh, system accounts or what have you. It all has to be done as part of our deployment or it can't be done. And so by doing this, we extend the Kubernetes infrastructure so that it, you know, in an, as Kubernetes native uh, possible, uh, as a way as possible. And so by doing this, the, uh, the virtual machines are actually inside a container. Um, some uh, solutions out there, such as uh, Kata containers, uh, I believe Vertlet maybe, actually modify the container runtime. That's something we're explicitly trying not to do because we don't want to be modifying that ahead of time. Now, in the future, that might be a restriction that's lifted because um, dynamic container runtimes is something that may come to Kubernetes in the future. But for now, that's kind of a hard and fast rule and one of the reasons that we're doing it the way we are. And you know, by leveraging our existing ecosystems, uh, teams are allowed to use the proper tool for th their uh, their solution. Whether that's a virtual machine or a container, they can put that right into their CI/CD pipelines. So for the way we implement this, we actually are using a custom resource definition. This is, um, you know, I've got an example of one over on the right. It's basically just a YAML file for those who haven't seen this before. Uh, for those who have uh, seen Kubernetes constructs before, this should look pretty familiar. In this case, the only thing special about it is the kind is a virtual machine instance. So virtual machines here have their own kind. And this gives us the ability uh, to express all common virtual machine parameters, such as memory, CPU, and the like. Because we're implementing this as a custom resource definition, we also inherit RBAC rules. Uh, so users are only allowed to modify things in the namespaces they're designed for and what have you. So here's a little bit of the workflow. This is a busy slide, so if I could take a minute to explain this. When the user uh, implements this custom resource or posts it to the system, that's a virtual machine instance. And so that's actually just a record on the, you know, in the SED cluster. We've got a, a controller, a vert controller, which is monitoring for changes to, um, to custom resources or to virtual machine instances in this case. And when it sees one, it actually schedules a pod. And that's all it does at this point, you just schedule a pod. And you can see that, you know, in this, is this the third step here. And then, uh, now the vert controller is a cluster level resource. So its only job is to schedule pods. Then on each of the individual nodes, uh, vert handler is running, and that's another controller we have, and it is looking for these pods 
that have a special label on them so that it knows that it owns that pod and it will then schedule starting the virtual machine inside of it. Now, there's a little bit of hand waving there, of course, because I said start a virtual machine in a container that's already running. So what we're actually doing is we've got a daemon called Vert Launcher inside this pod that's actually doing that work. Uh, you know, just some full disclosure there. <clears throat> So as far as scheduling, as I said, Vert Controller is scheduling a pod. That means that we're actually literally using a pod and pod rules for where we're going to end up placing virtual machines. That means anti-affinity, affinity, labels, um, selectors, the, all of those uh, constraints that you can put on a Kubernetes pod still work. And you can even use a custom scheduler if you needed. Now, the uh, applications within the virtual machines, because they are leveraging a pod, all existing Kubernetes constructs, such as services and routes, still work. And we'll get a little bit more into what those are later. But we actually use um, labels on the, uh, on the service itself to designate which pod uh, the, the uh, service belongs to, or where to route the packets, basically. So virtual machines live in pods. Now that's transparent to higher level uh, management systems, um, but you know technically that's not worse than it currently is before we you know, did this project. Now virtual machines leverage pods. When we have a, a new virtual machine uh, record, any labels that are on that will be translated over to the pod. We'll, we're going to need that for scheduling, of course, and to match things like services. CPU and memory resources, uh, they're actually matched from what the virtual machine's definition has to, to the pod so that we're not over allocating how much we're requesting. And of course, affinity and anti-affinity, I talked about that. As far as the storage, um, that's where the, the real rubber meets the road. Uh, we're using persistent volumes for this at the uh, production level. And so what that basically means is that um, any existing storage backend that you already have for a Kubernetes cluster, we can take advantage of. And that's a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, the persistent volume and your virtual machine disk. And so by doing this, of course, we can benefit from all existing uh, ecosystems that are currently out there, and there's a lot. So for the, uh, the disks, and this is actually not a Kubert project, this is a sister project, uh, the Containerized Data Importer. Um, I'm actually going to take advantage of that and use it in the demo in a few minutes um, because it's just that awesome. This is something that allows you to take an existing uh, virtual machine image, a raw disk or something, and actually import it directly into your Kubernetes cluster on the fly, which is something that obviously we're going to need if we're going to be able to pull this off, because that's a, been something that's been complicated for us in the past. So this is also, like Kubert, a declarative Kubernetes utility so that you have controllers and operators monitoring for resources that will take action when those resources show up. And so the two use cases here are to either designate an HTTP uh, URL that you would use to download an image from, or a second use case that I won't be showing is to actually use a read-only namespace within Kubernetes to copy uh, golden images to your user's namespace. That way they wouldn't modify the original and all the goodness that comes with that. So as far as the network goes, we're actually using the pod network for the virtual machine. Um, that's both bad and good. Uh, the, the good, of course, is that you're able to communicate with any existing uh, container resource as it currently exists. Um, so we can also expose these services from our virtual machine using services and routes, as I've mentioned, to uh, expose specific ports on your virtual machine to the outside world. We're looking at alternative networking options, such as multiple uh, networks or uh, different variants. But right now, what we're using is just a tap device inside the virtual machine. Um, the unfortunate part about that is we lose the ability to do live migration. Because in the, in the beginning, we actually had libvirt outside of our pod and uh, at the cluster level. And, or, or we had one libvirt per node, and that allowed us to do migrations between, um, to, to move a, a, a virtual machine between different nodes on your Kubernetes cluster. The, uh, the trouble with that was um, 
you know, a little bit of a rabbit hole, but we had some issues with PID namespaces and the like uh, that we were violating assumptions, and we just really couldn't do that. It wasn't a good model. So instead, we're actually doing one libvert per pod. And so libvert actually lives inside of the pod that we're deploying our virtual machine in. What that unfortunately means is libvert has no network access to the cluster or to other nodes. So we lose the ability to do live migration for now. Once we imp implement other networking options, we can reintroduce that. So looking at the virtual machine client tool, this is vert control. Um, one of the things that I sort of skipped over or have glossed over at this point is we're looking at virtual machine instances um, versus virtual machines. These are two different kinds of records. A virtual machine uh, is kind of a static template for a virtual machine instance. Point being, uh, in Kubernetes world, uh, if you start a pod or stop a pod, you're basically creating or deleting a resource. Uh, and so that's what our virtual machine instance is. It's kind of an analogy to that. But we recognize that that doesn't really translate well to the to the vert world of rev over and the like. People coming into this ecosystem or the tools that we're trying to translate to the system, that doesn't really work well. So we created the virtual machine object, and that's where when I'm talking about starting and stopping, that's what we're doing. We're, you actually issue a vert control start command on a virtual machine, and it will kick off an instance. It also allows us to connect to the console or use VNC in order to be able to interface with your virtual machine and kind of get a, um, a snapshot of what's going on because you're obviously going to need that. Now, there's two ways to do vert, or vert client, and that is either as a standalone command, which is what I'll be using, or you can actually use it as a cube control plugin so it would come straight off of cube control. And time for a demo. Real quick before I do that, I'd like to explain what my system looks like. So this slide, other than being an example of something complicated, is what my development environment looks like. Inside the, uh, the physical machine, we're actually running, and I'm sorry, Dan, I have to say, a Docker cluster. <laughs> Nearly got away with it, but it's on the slide. <laughs> Inside of uh, the D word, Docker, we... Um, we're running a Vagrant instance, and the reason we're doing this is for streamlining development so that everybody's machine looks the same, we're getting consistent builds and the like, but unfortunately it adds a little bit of complexity that I can't get around when I'm showing this as a demo. Uh, we'll be using uh, cube control commands directly from the physical machine. We've got a little sleight of hand where we're actually proxying these calls through the, uh, through the different layers here and down to node zero 01, but when I start working on the networking, the edge of the light gray box, node zero 01, is where your node ports actually terminate, and so I can't reach them from the physical machine. So I had to explain that before we uh, get into this. So if we start this off, um, I think I can just hit... So I'm actually just running a QMU instance here. Let's see if I can make this bigger. No, nope, don't want to do that. So I'm just booting a QMU instance here. We've got two gigs of RAM and uh, just a network device. So just a standard CentOS machine. It's logging in to uh, to show that you know what, what the environment looks like. It's just a standard run-of-the-mill CentOS machine. And you know all I did was take a. Uh, a 10 gig image I DD'd from dev zero and then run a QMU install on it and of course reskinned it with the devconf logo so that we would have something recognizable. So killing that off and I'm actually going to start a simple HTTP server here using uh, just Python which I wouldn't really recommend but it works great for a demo here. Um, so I'm going to use port 9090 and of course it, when you run this it's exposing all the files in this directory. One of them of course is disk.img uh, over port 9090 as a, a web server which will become important in a minute when we start using the containerized data importer. So here um, this is the containerized data importer. 
And what just happened was I'm using the, the Git tree, as you can see. There, there's a little bit of cruft there from the video. Ignore the second argument, or the, the last part of it. Uh, all it is is a, a pointer to uh, my Git repo with containerized data importer. And all I've done at this point to that is run uh, make manifests. So it's just a straight uh, you know, Git tree you can check out and run directly. And that's all I did here is just deploy these different pieces. So I've got a service account, uh, the cluster roles that are needed to actually do these actions, and of course the uh, the controller that is monitoring for persistent volumes or persistent volume claims that match its. Uh, it, it, they're actually annotated. I'll show that in a minute. <clears throat> So to show you what the, uh, the persistent volume claim here looks like, um, we're using annotations. And that's all that the uh, containerized data importer needs in order to recognize uh, persistent volume claims that it's supposed to be taking action on here. So as you can see, I've got port 9090, uh, disk IMG. Uh, this contrived IP address actually points back to my bare metal machine when I ran this demo. And of course, the key value pair. The key is the kubevert IO uh, storage import endpoint um, for uh, telling Q, uh, the containerized data importer where to go to fetch this image. The uh, commented out secret name, obviously, I don't need because I'm just using Python simple HTTP server. So it's just going to serve up whatever file it sees. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. And that's created the persistent volume claim already. And we'll look at the pods here real quick to uh, show that that's the case. Um, now, there ends up being a little bit of lag here, and that's an unfortunate uh, side effect of our current implementation. We're, um, and as you can see, it's now running. We're running the uh, upload for containerized data importer directly through the Cube ABI server. Now, in this case, that's a 10 gigabyte image. We're moving 10 gigabytes through the Cube ABI server. That's causing lag. I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> that is what it is. In the future, we're going to be um, re implementing that as its own server. Endpoint and using uh, you know different solutions in order to be able to authenticate so that we don't have that particular issue. Um, so checking the logs here, you see the import has begun. <clears throat> and so we're going to look at the virtual machine instance itself here. This is what's going to actually be using this uh, persistent volume claim that we're creating right now. So, you know, this is basically the bare minimum uh, that I would really want to uh, define in the first place. I've got two gigs of RAM. Uh, I've got a persistent volume claim in this case, which is mapping back to devconf-pvc, which is the, the persistent volume claim that we're actually creating with the uh, containerized data importer as we're going live. So highlighting some of that here. Um, and of course, two gigs of RAM. Sorry, I shouldn't have paused at that point. I'm basically repeating what it's doing. So quit out of there, and then we'll check on the... Uh, persistent volume claim again to see if it's up yet. Still not. <clears throat> but for now, let's look at the uh, services. We don't need to wait on the persistent volume claim itself to be uh, instantiated in order to be able to instantiate the service. So this is what it looks like. At this point, we're basically just going to use port 22 as our service, SSH, because it's already running on the CentOS box. And we're going to be exposing port 30,000 as a node port, which means that on the outer level of the light gray box, we're going to be using port 30,000 as SSH. 
So over here in devconf.yaml, um, I'm highlighting the incorrect thing. Actually, what I was wanting to show is the the label here is devconf.us demo, and that's just an arbitrary label that was put on to or that I put on. And so the selector on the service here, devconf.us colon demo, that key value pair is what indicates that this service should match that virtual machine. That's all you have to do. So we can go ahead and create that. And it's up. So I'll show that. So we've got a cluster IP of 1099.134.244, and the port that we're exposing is 30,000. And we can check the endpoints real quick. Um, so services always have an endpoint, which is where they map to on the other end. And at this point, of course, the endpoint that we're mapping to is none because we haven't created the virtual machine that maps to this yet. So let's check again, and it looks like the import has now completed. So let's check the logs real quick to make sure that everything went okay. And it did, right there, import complete, down near the bottom. And we don't need to worry about the warning for file because we didn't use that, we used HTTP. And here is the persistent volume itself that we're bound to. Um, and it is, is mapped to the, de the, the DevConf PVC. We don't need to worry about its name because that will be looked up automatically. So let's go ahead and create the virtual machine instance now. And show that we have a new pod for vert launcher, and it is running, been up for three seconds. And here's the virtual machine instance that it goes with. So let's check the uh, VNC console here, or log in through VNC. And the screensaver kicked on. Don't know how to get out. <laughs> Actually, no, we ran out of power on the uh, laptop. <laughs> we never plugged it in. <laughs> so, yeah, the power ran out on the laptop. <laughs> Here's a plug. We never plugged it in. <laughs> So at that point, we were showing the uh, the virtual machine, uh, you know, missed it right there. VNC was going to boot up and actually show that we were using the exact same image that we had started with on bare metal, which was, of course, uh, well, we've got a we've got a charge now. Um, but <laughs> it would take a minute for the machine to boot at this point. So, um, but that was basically you know, the only other thing that I wanted to show was the. Um, the service and actually how we mapped from that virtual machine, exposed that service because the, the endpoint that I showed you a moment ago was mapped to that pod for that virtual machine. And because we're mapping the virtual machines or the pod's IP to the virtual machine, that then terminated at the, um, the machine itself. Um, so then we were able to SSH in from the node IP itself. Uh, so it's something outside the cluster could then SSH into that box, which obviously if you're going to have a cloud-based virtual machine is a very essential um, point. From here, the, uh, yes? Uh, yeah, we was just going to talk about the next steps. Uh, of course, um, one of the things that I glossed over was that we don't, or that I was using local storage on this because it's a single instance machine. Um, you can use other backends. However, I chose not to do that because of the complexity of actually doing that on a single node. Uh, one of the things we'd like to work on in the future, of course, is making that a little easier to do. And um, multiple networks is, you know, is another thing that I had mentioned that is on our uh, major wish list. Uh, but from there, uh, I guess it's time to take questions. Yeah. Do you? We're bringing a mic. One second. Questions?
All right. Can you guys hear me? All right. I want to make sure I understood the containerized data importer. Is that what it was called? Yes. Okay. It's basically just a utility that will go grab an HTTP image of a disk image, right? Yes. But it runs as a container? Is that why it's called containerized? It is a container uh, that is basically running as a, you know, a run once container. Um, and that, you know, because as you see, it, it, saw, it said completed when it finished actually doing the import. Um, and so what that pod's job was to do was just simply to load the local storage in, on one end and connect HTTP on the other and just move the bits. Move and the it's bits doing into it, the PV. What's that? Just dumps the bits into the PV. Exactly. Okay. And it's doing it in the namespace space that you want on purpose. So whatever namespace you had mentioned in your virtual machine is where it's you know, the containerized data importer is going to start its pod, and then that, you know, we're not running into permissions issues by doing it that way. And there's, is that the only utility you have today? You don't have anything that will pull? I, I was talking to Steve Gordon here, and I, I thought there was some way to pull an OCI image that might be embedded with a kernel and all the things that you want to be able to do that. <laughs> So pull an OCI image with that's already got all the bits you want? Yeah, I mean, it's a nasty abuse of OCI, but it's it, it also would make it nice in that all the infrastructure would be the same, right? I think what you're talking about in that case is using a different, uh, uh, excuse me, container runtime. No? No, no, no. I'm saying, like, dump a VM image in an OCI image, stuff it in a registry, pull oh, that in right. instead of just a random disk image. Or another option would be just pull straight from Cinder. Like, I always wondered why. why not just so we actually do uh, have registry disks as a possible option here. Um, so, you know, you absolutely could do that. Um, I think that in a production environment, I would imagine maybe that the persistent volume claim would have just a more universal appeal. Uh, but yeah, we certainly could put it into a registry as well, a container registry, right? Um, we're actually doing that on our dev images right now. Uh, so we created Docker registry, sorry, uh, a container registry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we, you know, when we instantiate the develop environment, we stock it with an Alpine image and a, a Cirrus image and a couple others, you know, just so that we have base images to do all our testing infrastructure in. And so, yeah, we put that directly into a container registry and, uh, you know, utilize those images inside uh, KubeVert as well. Um, in that case, we actually have a... Uh, 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 there was one other pod that was sitting on the, uh, you know, when I would uh, was listing the pods. That's what was doing that. Yet one more pod. Any other questions? So um, this project's been going on for a couple of years. Uh, are there examples that are using this for, like, primary security, or are they just migrating existing virtual machines to make it easier to their existing workflow? And if the former, uh, can you give an example of of where it's better than just... I'm getting like a lot of echo. I couldn't hear the question. I'm sorry. So one of the benefits of running virtual machines on top of Kubernetes is you get more than just like LXC and C groups to do like sandboxing between different environments. Um, and I was curious, like, are there either customers of Red Hat or Red Hat that's using it um, in an area that they've like pen tested this on direct containers and, you know, they weren't secure enough and this was secure enough? And could you talk about that a little bit? So in terms of... Um, what I think the question is, is, you know, address security concerns or is, was security one of the things we were trying to address when we set this up? Um, yes, it is more secure. That wasn't necessarily our stated goal in terms of something we were setting out to accomplish. Uh, but you're right, there is a lot stronger process isolation when you run services inside of virtual machines like this. However, I would still point out that between other containers, there's no uh, isolation at that level anyway. So, you're this really I mean if security of now if you're looking at untrusted workloads in the virtual machine that's yeah this is great if you're looking at not trusting anything on the cluster you're going to need stronger guarantees does that answer the question yes so so the question was uh, how is it different from in the virtual machine versus just in a container and maybe who cares about that okay so in terms of what what's the difference in level of security between a virtual machine and a container level of process isolation 
<laughs> I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. The, the level of process isolation? Oh, the level of process isolation? Yeah. So, that, I mean, that is one of the reasons that you would run a virtual machine is because you have that stronger process isolation than you do with a container, which, you know, C groups, namespaces, SE Linux, I mean, those are strong guarantees, but in theory, you might be able to do something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, the virtual machine is a stronger guarantee, but that's not what we set out to do when we do that, when we set this up. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> If you don't mind, I might try to answer this question. I think I understand it. Okay. Um, so, like, I think you're thinking about it reverse. Like, like you're thinking about it from a security perspective. He's saying it exactly right. Don't think of it so from a security perspective, but we should tell him what to think about it. Think about it as a tool to pull a VM into a, an application similar to, you know, in a Kubernetes YAML file. Like, that's phenomenal, right? Because now I've got a database living in a VM. I've got front ends living in a container. And it's a way to scope the entire application with a single application definition. That's the beauty of Kubevert. On the other side of that, I would say something like Kata containers is where you're now running a container in a VM. It still pulls the VM image. It still uses all of the, I'm, I'm sorry, the container image. It uses all the container constructs that you care about. So now it's a packaging format. In that scenario, you're adding extra isolation you know, around a container. I think that's the way that you think about it in a, a security construct in that now it's an isolated container, but I still get all the packaging format advantages. This is the opposite. You don't get the packaging format advantages. You get bring in old stuff that's in a VM advantage which is a very, which is like the converse essentially thank you <laughs> first you owe me about 50 cents uh, uh, <laughs> can you spot me <laughs> uh, so one, one of the interesting things I would like to see with Cooper is to sort of be able to handle the kata container uh, use case in that um, you know, Kubernetes is running along and finds that it needs additional resources, or an application figures out that it needs additional resources, so it calls into Kubernetes and launches additional VMs that then Kubernetes could take advantage of those new VMs to launch more containers inside of. Is that, has that been considered, or is that... Possible? Well, so the big limitation to what we're setting out right now is that we're uh, attempting to not modify the Kubernetes cluster, or not require it to be modified ahead of time. And so, because in order to be able to run a virtual machine as a container, that requires a different container runtime than the default. So we can't ask a, an administrator to necessarily do that, because that's going to increase the friction. In the future, if... Uh, um, Kubernetes does allow dynamic container runtimes to be injected in on the fly, then we can explore using virtual machines directly or using them in the Kata container sort of approach where the point is for process isolation. Does that answer the question? I mean, I'm not looking for necessarily the, I mean, the isolation would be great, um, but just being able to launch more, be, you know, at a certain point, an application has run out of resources inside of the existing VMs, and it needs to launch more VMs. So usually Kubernetes breaks at that point and has to fall back on OpenStack or some other tool for launching more VMs. I, I just thought that Kubernetes could be a way to actually... Oh, so resource overrun? Right, right. Um, I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting angle. More questions? We have about three more minutes, maybe less. Uh, is there a way to pass like a cloud config as part of the virtual machine instance object? Oh, uh, cloud init data? Yeah. Yes, I did not show that. Add that into the virtual machine, and, um, <clears throat> and you know, basically, cloud init is its own standard, so we're not doing anything special there. We're just injecting that data and making it available. We do that usually through a uh, through its own volume mount. So just to confirm, the Kubert has no access to the VM itself, right? It just brings up the VM, and you're expected to know how to make use of it. That's a loaded question. No, uh, what I mean, no, what I mean is, like, there's no 
for example, if there's no like injection in the cloud config of like an SSH key. Um, well, you can do cloud init data. You can do an SSH key that way, absolutely. Right, right. But, I mean, that's up to the user. That's up to the, the user to do yeah. what they, yeah, to set out. Presumably, you would know that you wanted to do that, however. So, we're, yeah, we're exposing the ability to do that. And, yeah. yes, you can use that, or but you have to know to do that. Right, right. What I just mean is the Kubert just brings it up, and that's it. Like, there's no management inside of the VM itself. Uh, in August good. 18th, good 2018, thing. that's the answer is yes. Yeah. That's true. Um, we are looking at other possibilities in terms of doing um, a, a monitor application that would be available. But of course, you know, how do you do that in a generalized fashion if you're booting, booting up a generalized virtual machine? Suddenly, you're building, you know, your own VMware sort of right. infrastructure. So yeah. yes, we're we're looking into possibilities for limited cases. Last question, maybe? All right. Okay, out of time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.